Welcome everyone to the February uh, Hyperledger Financial Markets Mortgage Subgroup Meeting. That's always a mouthful. Um, before we get started, I always like to express our appreciation to the Financial Markets Special Industry Group that we fall under, the Hyperledger Foundation for their ongoing support and making this group possible. A as I said, our speaker today is Kamlesh Nagwari, who will be discussing hybrid blockchain. Uh, so why don't we go ahead and get started, and I will move on to the next slide. Sorry, just moving a little too fast this morning. As always, please note that this meeting is being recorded and is under the umbrella of the Hyperledger Foundation. So we ask that everyone abide by the antitrust policy and the code of conduct. The antitrust policy that we're sharing states that we avoid discussions of company specific products and projects, don't make negative remarks about other companies or products. And the code of conduct means that we treat each other with respect never discriminate and communicate constructively. We fully support Hyperledger's policy of openness, equity, and inclusion. And for new participants, we welcome you. And if you'd like, please introduce yourself on the chat and let us know if there's any specific areas of interest or anything that you would like to add. Our agenda today, will go through the introduction, covers uh, the Hyperledger community information, James will provide an update of blockchain in the mortgage industry. Kamlesh will go through the hybrid blockchain and then we'll have a Q&A. We always cover this slide at the beginning of each meeting. And this is to reinforce that we're all on the same blockchain journey, that, but we may be at different points along that journey. This group is meant to help everyone on their blockchain journey and to demonstrate the feasibility of blockchain technology through mortgage industry use cases, define potential implementation paths for the mortgage industry, and what does a mortgage company need in order to implement blockchain, and just to talk about the difficulty or challenges of implementing blockchain. Okay, the next three slides, I always mention for those that are new to the group or would like more information, this slide provides links to different resources for the Linux Foundation, Hyperledger Foundation, the Mortgage Subgroup is second from the bottom. These are great resources and we'll reference several of them, but I'm not going to spend a lot of time on these slides. If you do want to access these resources, this slide tells you how to get a Linux Foundation ID or LFID. So take a look at this, take a look at the video. And then the last slide, these are some links for those of you that are new to blockchain. Uh, this training is free. This is how I got knowledgeable about blockchain. So this is uh, excellent training and it's free. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to James Hendrick, who will walk us through the state of blockchain in the global mortgage industry. Excellent. Thank you very much, Marvin. Welcome, everybody. Um, let's go ahead and move on to the first slide. So we've got a couple great articles this time. Again, all of these articles are accessible from the uh, Hyperledger Wiki site. Uh, but first off, touching on the metaverse, which we've talked about before. So real estate's always been considered an investment for passive income. But now there's really a global audience interested in buying property within the metaverse. And given its perspective size, there's a huge chance to generate passive income in this area. Owning real estate and renting it out is among the most well-known methods for generating additional income within the metaverse. You know, previously we've talked about Decentraland and the Sandbox as an example. Unfortunately, there isn't much available information on the earnings metaverse landlords are currently anticipating since this data is not publicly disseminated. However, as businesses look to, you know, hold events in the metaverse, it is considered to be a very profitable market. And as the adoption of the metaverse grows, the demand for experts and experienced professionals in this area will surely grow. And I, I thought that really was one of the biggest takeaways from this article. 
Coming from Coindesk, um, Intain is our platform for trading tokenized asset-backed securities built as an avalanche subnet called Intain Markets. So a subnet is a sovereign network that defines its own rules and is comprised of groups of validators that work together to reach consensus on one or more blockchains. Tokenization is a growing trend among financial institutions as it allows traditional financial players to attract more investors by using blockchain technology. According to a report from the Boston Consulting Group and Asia's Private Market Exchange, the asset tokenization industry will expand to a $16.1 trillion business opportunity by 2030. And Intain's digital marketplace automates the functions such as the verification of agent, underwriting, uh, rating agencies, ser servicer, trustee, and the investor. So according to the company, rather than replacing trust intermediaries, Intain Markets integrates them into a singular platform and process to enable digital issuance and investment on chain. And the company's first platform, Intain Admin, currently administers over $5.5 billion in assets. And then lastly, we've got a new survey from Casper Labs and Zogby Analytics really kind of revealing the sentiment around blockchain adoption um, and how it is having uh, you know, a positive influence among enterprises. The poll was conducted with over 600 as, uh, positive, excuse me, the, call was, the poll was conducted with over 600 business enterprise decision makers in the US, UK, and China. And 90% of those businesses surveyed reported deploying blockchain technology in some capacity, with 87% saying they plan to invest in blockchain in the next year. In China, over half of the respondents plan to invest in blockchain in 2023. So where do the enterprise leaders fall short? Uh, blockchain is not crypto, uh, the message that we've been carrying out for the last several months. Despite 73% feeling confident in their knowledge of blockchain technology, 54% of the respondents still see the terms blockchain and crypto as interchangeable. And that's you know really what organizations like this is all about, because education is the biggest challenge and barrier for those outside of the blockchain space wishing to interact with the technology and communicate with their clients uh, on an educated basis about it. A few other interesting stats out of this article, uh, businesses already utilizing the tech are benefiting from two of its main capacities, uh, security and copy protection at 42% reporting in, and IT-based operations are using blockchain for internal workflows at 40%, supply chain efficiencies at 34%, and software development at 30%, among others. And next slide, Marvin. And lastly, our esteemed Marvin Van Tugen uh, recently posted a blog in the Blockchain Industry Group. And um, actually, since we've got him here, Marvin, do you want to talk about this a little bit? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, thanks, James. So the intent of this article for the Blockchain Industry Group was just to tell the reader about Zaventes' own blockchain journey. So this is to demonstrate that we actually do eat our own dog food. It walks through how we assess the business opportunity uh, but within the mortgage industry, how we took a look at the different potential platforms and chose Hyperledger Fabric, and then how we utilize the different tools that Hyperledger makes available. Like for example, the sample use cases, we started off with those. Um, that was a real great experience. It got our team up and running. It helped us set up our own blockchain lab. And then we started to take those learnings and apply it to specifically the mortgage industry. We created our own uh, proof of concept and we actually went through a series of proof of concepts. And that's one of the things we outlined within that article. We went through our three different proof of concepts and then we talked about how we're now applying those learnings to our own blockchain mortgage application. 
Um, a lot of the learnings are listed there. Take advantage of the open source community. Have a lot of discussions on architecture, monitor your processing requirements, and of course, test, test, test. And then when you're done, test some more. So uh, I, I think this was a, a really good article. I, I am tooting my own horn a little bit. It, it was a lot of fun to write and, and please take a look at it and hopefully it helps you out. Yeah, Marvin, you're definitely not tooting your horn loud enough on this. This is really a fantastic article. If you're looking about, hey, where should I start? What are the things that I should be thinking about? And, you know, what's that journey? What's that road going to look like for us? Uh, Marvin does a fantastic job here of walking through what we've, we've been doing. Um, final slide, Marvin. And just as a reminder, here's a copy of our wiki site along with the uh, URL down at the bottom. Um, I'll actually pop that into the chat right now for easy access. So all of the articles that we have covered, including Marvin's, you can access directly on the right-hand side. Over on the left-hand side, as Marvin mentioned, we've got the minutes and the recordings from all of our previous presentations going back to 2021. So do, you know, take the opportunity to access them there. We also have down there near the bottom the previous mortgage blockchain research that we've been doing. So articles that are about three to four months old, I start moving over there and I keep the most recent articles on the right. We have curated a large library of articles. You know, we're probably running well over 200 now over the last year and a half. So if you guys are looking for information, if you're looking for something to, uh, you know, build case scenarios for yourself, feel free to reach out. And or if you guys have articles that you come across, love for you to share them and we may feature them in these presentations. Um, I'll pass it back over to you, Marvin. Hey, thanks, James. Uh, next, I would like to introduce you to Kamlesh Nagwari. He's the CTO of blockchain at Snapper Future Tech. I had the pleasure of working with Kamlesh at the 2022 IEEE Global Emerging, Emerging Technology Conference. Uh, he has 12 years experience in software development, IT consulting, and blockchain. He is among the top 30 most influential people in blockchain in India. He's also the co-chair of Hyperledger India and a member of the Hyperledger Technical Steering Committee. Um, and he's also a TEDx speaker. So we're very honored to have him on board. And thank you, Kamlesh, for joining us today. And I'll turn it over to you. Yeah, so <clears throat> uh, thank you, Marvin and James, for inviting. So I think uh, you are kind enough to talk about my latest blog. So as a, as a because every by week I every by week I write some newsletter about the blockchain adoption and blockchain trends, and this week I wrote about uh, hyper hybrid blockchain because uh, in the in the recent uh, I think in, from last I think global forum there are lots of talk about the hybrid blockchain at the global forum in Dublin and recently in the DevOps uh, hyperledger meetups and meetings. So I think uh, hybrid blockchain is growing, and there are there are maybe people are using, but maybe they are not knowing. So uh, can I share my screen so I can talk uh, present it? Yes. So I think it's my thought process, and uh, my I'm not that much expert in the hybrid thing, but at least what we are doing at the company level and what each actually. So maybe you will get some idea. So first I will talk like uh, I just written this particular uh, 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 newsletter the future is hybrid blockchain and that is on the on the my thought process and how the uh, blockchain is uh, uh, moving toward uh, public private to now hybrid and uh, some use cases and uh, some kind of case studies and all thing and I think this is recently also hyperledger posted on the hyperledger uh, foundations uh, uh, Twitter, uh, LinkedIn Twitter handles so uh, anyway, uh, I have my presentation which I created just today only. And I think before that, I uh, uh, James mentioned about this intent market. So I think how the technology is maturing and becoming a production grade. So even I 
I, I, I was the first employee when they uh, offered me to join that company, the Intent. I know the founder and CEO very well in my personal touch. So he offered me to join his company, this Intent in 2017. And now we see like he's now is featured and now having a uh, in the production grade implementation. I think they are using the Hyperledger fabric and now exploring the other uh, other blockchain. And this is we can say is a kind of hybrid blockchain. So we can see the this internet itself is a hybrid blockchain kind of because for a few of the components they are using the Hyperledger fabric and now they this intent market is a part of the Avalanche blockchain and they are also doing with other public blockchains too. So I think this kind of combination of blockchain solution is kind of hybrid blockchain. So, so I'm talking about hybrid blockchain, why hybrid blockchain and use cases. So typically is a combination of both actually. So uh, in the one solution in the, some particular uh, piece or the feature, are you using the private blockchain permission blockchain like Fabric, R3, Coda, Quorum, or any other such kind of permission blockchain. And for few uh, uh, section or kind of because there's some features of the same problem solved using the public blockchain. So this combination of using the public and private blockchain is called a hybrid blockchain actually. So you can utilize both uh, both beauties of the uh, beauties of both blockchain. So you can uh, uh, use the transparency and security of public blockchain and uh, permission and permission and control and privacy of the private blockchain because in some organizations, some use cases, we need the privacy and the security is a main goal and don't want to share the data outside uh, to the particular organizations need. And some of the data use cases, you need the want to utilize the public blockchain, whether it's a liquidity purpose or maybe bringing the more transparency for the public goods or public. So like uh, nowadays, I think uh, organization is uh, uh, we're using both kind of combination together for solving the some problems. Even uh, we are one of the, our supply chain solution, we are using the same thing. So for end-to-end -end traceability of the uh, uh, product, we are using the Hyperledger fabric and then tokenizing that assets and product uh, information, we are using the Polygon blockchain. So I think this is a, a kind of flavor we can say the uh, hybrid blockchain. So why now have, uh, enterprise is actually going towards the uh, hybrid blockchain? So uh, my thought process uh, is a couple of points. One is flexibility because uh, a couple of organizations think like they need the privacy and control, but some point they also need some kind of transparency or allowing a public participant to take in the their uh, <laughs> their business processes. So this is one reason. And another reason I have seen many organization even actually oh. running a private blockchain and unknowingly now they even uh, incorporating all kind of uh, this public blockchain combination, like I mentioned in the supply chain perspective, like uh, a traceability of the real world assets and then tokenizing real person in a, in a, in a public blockchain. Because uh, I think when we see the public and private blockchain both work, usability in the UI of public blockchain is very good. Like suppose if you want to do this tokenization, then uh, EVM blockchain is best. You come forward with uh, uh, direct wallet application, good UI experience, no need to be right about the infrastructure and infrastructure is a code deployment. So you just need to write your smart contract and integrate with your front end and it's, you are done. But in the permission blockchain, you do lots of governance and lots of things to be maintained. So that's why people are organization is moving toward the using of both technologies. Another is the security and privacy. So uh, some kind of like some organization enterprises want to control uh, some data points, whether uh, even like we know like right, there are many block public blocks and also talk about the ZK page zero knowledge proof, but it's still uh, suppose you're following some uh, GDPR compliances or uh, even even organization is not comfortable to share the data outside. So even even currently we are discussing with one customer, they want to utilize the same 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 model. Okay, like let's do uh, my end to end uh, uh, data input using the some private permission blockchain, and then I want to share some specific field like like say five to six fields where we can use as a, a public domain available. And many such solutions. So like there is a solution in Maharashtra. They 
issuing some digital certificates on uh, on blockchain and that is typically hyperledger fabric based uh, digital certificate and then uh, storing that uh, proof of uh, transaction on a public blockchain like polygon so and i think this is not new i think this is around uh, one year old uh, live in production in maharashtra government in one of the indian state so organization is trying this kind of tricks and some kind of way to uh, bring the usability of this uh, uh, technical solution they, they they don't care whether the private blockchain is required or public blockchain required if customer is happy and comfortable to and whatever the customer need now they can customize using this both tools together another is scalability so <laughs> sorry so in uh, when we have private permission blockchain then scalability in your control uh, how many organization how many uh, participant you want to uh, manage you can govern that thing and so in such solution where you require such kind of thing where you want public blockchain but also need the scalability of solution then you could uh, enable this kind of uh, solutions interoperability so that is another thing so uh, let's say for example there is a supply chain financing kind of thing where supply chain you are doing some end to end traceability of your material and then want to finance the uh, particular uh, uh, supplier for that payment so that maybe both are separate uh, network could be there maybe on the same technology or maybe on the different from blockchain so and i think that's why this hyperledger cactus cacti weaver and other interoperability blo blockchain products are is emerging because now now for the interoperability perspective people are using the hybrid blockchain concept where they are uh, taking some certain uh, uh, things in a one uh, blockchain and then remaining in a uh, different blockchain another is a compliance and regulation so that that is about like uh, gdpr or other kind of privacy data com uh, compliance and regulation or or other thing for example uh, still there are uh, uh, not clear about the crypto regulations digital asset regulation in a in a mostly uh, most countries so in that kind of scenarios you can uh, go with a customer to implement the private blockchain for example and it is not not kind of regulatory concern for example because there is not there no crypto involved and for the other step you can uh, use the public blockchain so i think this kind of, these are the few reasons where i think i enterprises are looking uh, at the hybrid blockchain kind of solution and so <coughs> because <coughs> sorry because you know, we are talking in the financial services uh, working group so why i put some point like how the uh, how the blockchain could be beneficial or could be game changer for financial services because in financial services are is a very complex word there are there are many regulate regulations there are lots of different uh, compliances come in the picture and uh, mostly a uh, blockchain nowadays used in the financial services sectors so there is also the liquidity is need uh, uh, and so so public blockchain could bring the uh, liquidity in the this kind of digital as asset or kind kind of uh, kind of kind of ecosystem and permission private blockchain to record the transaction proof at the or, or the or the traceability of the any transaction and it will also bring the interoperability because uh, different financial services are building on different uh, blockchain protocols and uh, this kind of hybrid blockchain could enable the that interoperability in easy way so uh, this is the design and uh, i mentioned couple of use cases where uh, some of the production something is happening like suppose there is a, a xdc network from zenfin so they having a some interoperable blockchain network for global trade and finance so there are digitization and uh, other digital transformation process is happening on the uh, quorum blockchain and then tokenization and uh, uh, other uh, infer other related uh, liquidity perspective part piece happening on the uh, public blockchain on uh, ethereum so this is one of the kind of case study there i think there are many such uh, another kind of use cbdc so i think there are cbdc there are multiple uh, i think almost 114 countries uh working on cbdc and there are different different uh, architecture different different uh, 
business model they are they are working so cbdc could also be uh, one of the use cases where hybrid blockchain could be used even i i just uh, gone through the this particular i triple e uh, uh, news newspaper uh, news article uh, okay research paper how how the cbdc could be leverage the public and private blockchain combination together so i think this is very interesting like how uh, some piece maybe you can uh, take care about on a like commercial banking and financial institution onboarding on a private blockchain for their customer and then as a consumer facing site you could have a some kind of public blockchain another is tokenization and digital asset of uh, this thing so i think typically like what even we are doing with our, our product where we are uh uh end to end traceability of the any asset we are doing on a private permission blockchain because uh, uh participant in the uh, organization only want to see the traceability of thing but at the at the at the consumer side maybe you could create an nft of this token uh, this particular information and could be uh traded in secondary market and so this kind of solution uh, is part of the this Uh, kind of initiatives another kind of insurance use cases so even uh, i think day before yesterday i joined the climate action accounting uh, sig so there is a kind of agriculture insurance where you, i think they are they are kind of uh, using a both combination where they are using uh, a private blockchain in somewhere to record the end to end transaction details and then uh, carbon credit or uh, insurance uh, settlement happening on a uh, on a on a public blockchain uh, like polygon and uh, even even this payment settlement process also they uh, have enablement on to use the both kind of blockchain if suppose uh, you are customer and you are consumer want to use the fiat currency kind of thing so they can use the permission blockchain to do that uh, enablement and if consumer is interest is okay to use the crypto and other token kind of mechanism then they are using a, um, a public blockchain with polygon uh, another use cases in like kyc ml kind of thing where where uh, uh can uh, storing and sharing the kyc details can be done on a uh, privacy and sense kind of control environment uh, at, at the at the banks and institution side and then uh, maybe for bringing the kyc ml at the broader level as a, as a common kyc ml model it could be uh, open as a, as a, as a uh, public blockchain model so is not public blockchain is like only public blockchain like polygon or ethereum maybe uh, you can say the governance of your your private blockchain or consensus blockchain is a open network uh, where where you can open some kind of apis and then uh, other participant can access the network so is not necessarily like hybrid blockchain is always public blockchain and private blockchain it could be private blockchain framework but in the governance side you could uh, set up in whatever way you want to set up certain uh, part of the network or certain part of the uh, solution in a completely controlled and uh, permission environment and some of the transaction and the processes in a publicly uh, uh, domain kind of thing so and i think this i have taken from uh, this capsar uh, casper labs and uh, this recent this study they did like so how the currently uh, the blockchain wise the adoption is happening so if you see uh, this hybrid blockchain is not new right if you see this uh, blue color i think i think 38% uh, organization already using the hybrid kind of blockchain in in their use cases and is a uh, globally us uk and in, in china and then uh, private blockchain part and then uh, 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 pub public blockchain but majority of using the hybrid blockchain so and and this is done the survey on the 600 uh, organizations uh, globally by casper labs so i think and that's why i i think like uh, hybrid blockchain is going to the uh, going to be the game changer for adoption of technologies because because now uh, even there are many customers even i faced in day to day my life where where customer don't care about the decentralization and uh, other thing maybe just they need the maybe immutability perspective for example or smart contract so 
uh, this kind of thing can be can be can be implemented by the future of okay, kind of uh, 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 hybrid blockchain kind of setups so uh, you could use the uh, public private blockchain or private blockchain in both uh, permission or permissionless uh, setup way right, to uh, create the customer oriented uh, use cases and i think that's i believe like uh, hybrid blockchain is going to be next uh, thing and i think i think that's why even hyperledger foundation and uh, many other uh, 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 blockchain communities now started talking about uh, hybrid blockchain uh, so yeah thank you so any question uh th huh. thank you uh, kamlesh that that was a, a great presentation uh, excellent information on hybrid blockchains and i think we do have uh, a couple questions so let me turn it over to the team hey, kamlesh i have a question um so you know with this group in the past we've talked about consortiums you know groups of banks or other institutions coming together and you know, working on a solution. And I think your case studies that you showed here are an excellent way of demonstrating that. You know, when you think about consortiums, you think about companies coming together to do this, what are some of the biggest challenges they can, you know, anticipate that they need to address um, when developing a hybrid blockchain? So I think main challenge I believe is about the ROI. I think, uh, if, if you see the example of trade lens and the V dot trade and uh, other other implementation, so if there's a not uh, right incentive model to the all the participant in the network, then I think uh, whatever the how the technology is good is not going to be adopted. So so and I think I think and that's why this hybrid kind of blockchain is going to be beneficial because you could bring the incentivization and uh, using the public blockchain via liquidity or some tokenization kind of uh, kind of instruments excellent um and i you know in the chat daniel if you want to come off you mute feel free your question's a little bit lengthy and you've got some color to add to it yeah how do you build up an operator hybrid block system so i think and Hyperledger, I think we have a project called like Hyperledger Tech Test. So I think this is the, I think, uh, best framework and protocol to implement such kind of thing. So because in uh, Hyperledger Tech Test, I support the multiple blockchain framework, Fabric, Besu, Arthricoda, or Ethereum, or other, other kind of public blockchain. So, and recently this merged with uh, this Hyperledger Weaver Labs. It also offer the some other uh, kind of interoperability uh, APIs kind of kind of driven. So, so I think this kind of tech tech could be combined together. So I think I believe like hybrid. So there are multiple things. One is hybrid blockchain where you are using a separate two blockchain in the same solution to some certain pieces. Uh, another thing maybe you are using a, a hybrid blockchain in terms of interoperability perspective where you are doing some certain piece on one blockchain and then using that data information in uh, using in some other blockchain via via whether the api or other bridges or uh, any other kind of uh, interoperability mechanisms available so i think cacta is the right uh, protocol to implement such kind of thing and but i think there are like polka dot there is a winfin and i think couple of solution provider are there in in this but i think cacta is the right uh, protocol to implement and even like um, Firefly in the in the in the Hyperledger ecosystem. Yeah, uh, Kamlesh, I'm glad you mentioned Firefly in response to Daniel's uh, question. Uh, Daniel, I highly recommend using Firefly because it sets up quote unquote the plumbing for Hyperledger Fabric. Uh, when we switched to Firefly, it made our proof of concepts that we were building so much easier. It, it really helps you get to that next level. If you've already done Ethereum by hand and you wanna build something larger with Firefly, definitely do so. If you wanna reach out to me afterwards, or if you wanna join the Firefly community group, 
They're very helpful. There's a ton of different um, ways that you can do this that will make it a lot easier. Okay. Uh, Kamlesh, I did have a, a question for you because one of the things that we've been starting to hear, especially within the financial services industry, is increased interest in tokenization. You, you spoke a little bit about tokenization being used in a hybrid blockchain. Can you uh, speak a little bit more about that? Because when I think about tokenization in a hybrid blockchain, some of the questions that pop into my mind, and maybe they're not appropriate questions, is does the token live on the private uh, blockchain, on the permissioned? Where is it created? How does it transition from one to another? Or are those really um, questions that are not, uh, not appropriate for a hybrid model? So, so I think I think it depends on the use case to use cases where I think uh, maybe tokenization, I think uh, tokenization is some kind of way of uh, digital representation of your asset. So protocol doesn't matter, is a public or private, you could do that thing. If your customer or your, consum uh, your uh, uh, client is okay to having a permission blocking because uh, even we face sometime when the customer wants the tokenization on the pub permission blockchain too. So that can be done also, but I think mostly tokenization people use mostly part they are known as a liquidity uh, kind of settlement kind of thing. So on that time, I think public blockchain is the right, right thing to do. But sometimes tokenization you are also using internally uh, for your business process perspective. Yeah. So on that time, it doesn't matter whether you're using a uh, permission or a public blockchain. But if your tokenization is for the public or consumer facing side, then I think public blockchain is the right thing because because as I just mentioned in the starting, like you user interface and the simplicity, user experiences, I think is still a challenging for the permission kind of blockchain because you need to take care of all the things about, about the uh, transaction signing to the wallet and data signature, all need to be taken care by the developer. But in the public blockchain, all is there. You just need the wallet ex extension in your browser and can manage it. Okay, so where where would I create uh, the the token first? Would I create it in, in the private blockchain um, and then expose it to the public, or or no, I, it, I, does I, it I, depend I, upon the use case? I think that's the use is. case. But but let's say for example, uh, let's say suppose you're doing some kind of carbon accounting and then tokenization. So carbon yeah, accounting yeah. information you could do on a your permission hyperledger fabric kind of or any kind of very uh, uh, regarding some data points about the your accounting of the particular information and then tokenization you could read this data via the any interoperable framework like ecti or other thing and read this data and pass to the your uh, public blockchain uh, endpoint to tokenize it this way okay okay uh, thank you. Uh, there's another question in the chat from Elma. Are there examples of hybrid blockchain in in the mortgage industry that you know of? No, I don't know, but I but but I believe I think obviously because this is the study, right? There are thirty eight to forty percent our companies are using the hybrid blockchain combination. So I think definitely we can find out something something okay. happening in the industry. Okay, great. Uh, uh, are there any other questions from the group for Kamlesh on uh, hybrid blockchain? Okay, uh, I do have uh, one last question, Kamlesh, and it regards the processing costs. Because what we found in our proof of concept is the processing cost can be significant, either from an AWS perspective, if you, if you have your blockchain there, or if you're using one of the third party providers of different blockchain technology, I mean, there can be a uh, licensing and processing costs from that perspective. It, are processing costs expected to be higher for hybrid blockchains? Because now you have public and permission. So uh, what are your thoughts on that? No, I think, I don't think so. I think uh, processing cost, I think in the public side, it maybe depend on the uh, your uh, gas fees. Mm -hmm. But the yeah. infrastructure perspective, uh, maybe you are using the same same thing, or, or maybe less. For example, suppose if you are completely solution in a private blockchain, so maybe you are 
may be needing the more infrastructure but in public blockchain maybe certain piece of doing in the public blockchain then you are uh, just paying the gas fees but about the viability of this thing it depend on the uh, gas fees and the uh, transaction fees on the public blockchain side okay so great even i can give recently an example like suppose recently there's the uh, ipv ipve ipwe i think they have done some kind of uh, hybrid blockchain for 25 million nfts so they are doing uh, i think is available and recently announced in the devos uh, uh, meeting so they are they have minted around 25 nfts mm -hmm. of the public blockchain and they are using this information on a some hybrid fabric based blockchain so i think i think this kind of examples are many where uh, companies are using this kind of setups okay Great. Yeah, and I think someone put the IPWE in, in the chat. Okay. Thank you. So I think Thank I think this that. is the biggest NFT minted so far in any of yep. the blockchain. Twenty five million uh, patents uh, tokenized as NFTs mm -hmm. using the Hyperledger and uh, public blockchain together. Okay. Great. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, are there any other questions for Kamlesh uh, from the team? Okay, um, I think that's all the questions. Uh, Kamlesh, thank you for joining our group uh, and uh, your contact information is, is in that presentation. We'll share it with the rest of the team afterwards. So if anyone would like to contact Kamlesh, uh, and with any other questions or, or just to exchange information that will be available. Uh, so yeah. uh, thank you again, Kamlesh. We appreciate yeah. uh, you speaking with us today. Yeah, absolutely, Kamlesh. Thank you for taking the opportunity to join our group. <coughs> yeah, <laughs> thank you, James. Okay, uh, so uh, the next item on the agenda uh, was just to go over uh, let's see here if I can go back to the presentation. Uh, is just to go over any potential future topics. Um, I don't know if, if there's any future topics that people in the audience would like us to address in the future, but I just want to open it up to the team. So if there are any topics that you would like us to uh, address, by all means, let us know. And we can definitely add those to the agenda. I'm reaching out to additional speakers that can uh, join us in, in the future. Uh, we'll continue to talk about business cases. We'll have technical demonstrations, knowledge sharing. And, and I know one of the items from last year that we didn't get a chance to address is getting someone from one of the regulatory bodies or compliance agencies to come speak with us. I'm still working on that, and that's at the top of my list. If anyone on this call has any contacts uh, that we could speak to, by all means, let me know, and we will add that to the future. Um, uh, I would like to open it up to the rest of the team to just see if there are any additional questions, uh, either for myself, James, anyone else on this event as team, or Kam Lesh. So just one last uh, query for any questions. Yeah, hey guys, I'll come off mute and ask a question. Uh, Lucas Whaley, I'm at Lima One Capital. Um, we're a, a private uh, business purpose lender. Uh, are we seeing any movement or use in the in in blockchain for, I guess, dealing with counterparty complexity with whole loan sales? So from from warehouse to you know other counterparties to ultimately to securitization. Uh, there are a couple companies that I've heard of that are starting to look at that. Um, I, I thought one of them was actually going to be on the call today. Have you ever heard of Lender Blocks? Uh, I have not, no. Yeah, Lender Blocks does whole loan securitization, and they were actually taking a look at um, using blockchain technology. Uh, so Sorry, I guess an, an additional question on that, I guess, within the hyper hyperledger community. 
uh, within the Hyperledger community. Uh, I don't know if anyone is actually using Hyperledger specifically for that. So uh, I can double check, but the closest that I've heard of was Lender Blocks. They're yeah. up in the Bay Area. Their CEO uh, is Paul Bowen, and he he joins us on occasion. So um, I, I can put you in touch with him if you'd like. Okay, Marvin, I guess I've got your contact info, so I'll follow up off call. Okay, cool. Thanks. Thanks. Okay, uh, anyone else have any questions? Uh, I know that there are some questions. Uh, there are some chats. I uh, don't know if there are any additional questions in there. Nope, uh, Kamlesh put his contact information there. So one last query for questions. Okay, guys, um, I think that that's it. Uh, thank you very much for joining us in this session. Here is our contact information for anyone that would like to uh, contact us with any questions uh, or any uh, additional comments. Please let us know. Uh, please join us for the next Hyperledger session. This takes place the second Thursday of every month. And with that, I will end it. Thank you for attending. Give you guys 15 minutes back to your day. And Kamlesh, again, thank you for joining us. Yeah, thank you. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye, everyone. Thank you.